Oh, wow. What are slea stacks? Is you that don't know what slea stacks are? That's Land of the Lost, isn't yeah. it? <gasps> That's yeah. Land of the Lost? Yeah. Oh, I loved Land of the Lost. I hated the slea stacks. It was so dumb. They never, ever got caught by them, and they walked so slow. It didn't matter. Yeah. I think it would never get you anyway. They, right. they would run past them. and Yeah. Yeah. Bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Welcome to In the Act, a radio program on process and the creative life. Creativity does not just start and stop with artists. We all make aesthetic or guiding decisions in our lives. Our aim is to talk through this process and investigate how we choose to express ourselves and how we live creatively. We're connecting with people about their lives, and that's the subject of our show. Broadcasting from Mead Public Library in Sheboygan, Wisconsin on Mead Community Radio, I am Erica Hunsinger, and this is In the Act. And today's guest on In the Act is David Bourgeois. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thanks so much for being here. I'm so excited. And I'm glad I got your name right. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's exciting. I, I loved listening to all your former, you know, interviews with people that's great most of whom i know so it was interesting to hear a different side from people that i've known for years yeah totally yeah, yeah. it's really interesting um i mean every everybody has a story yeah that's you know um, for sure so i um i think you represent so much of like what is creative like you live in so many parts of your life creatively and um and also, I'm really excited to talk to you <laughs> about your um, the beginning, like your your major work um, of working with kids and being a music instructor mm -hmm. for 31 years. Yes, it's so exciting, and I have such a passion. I worked for like 20, almost 20 years as a preschool teacher, and so oh, this nice. like I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the importance of early childhood education yeah. and conflict resolution and instilling creativity and flexibility in their thinking and mm -hmm. uh, expression, um, all of those things is like, that was like your passion and what you worked with. And um, yeah. I don't know, you can start anywhere you want to. Okay. Um, I was really lucky as an educator. Both of my parents were teachers, oh. and um, my older sister was a music teacher as well. And I have 18 first cousins, and I think 11 of them were teachers. Oh, and wow. most of my aunts and uncles were teachers. So I knew what I was getting into, yeah. and I always respected them. And I had a different perspective of going to school because my parents were in the building. I couldn't get away with anything because right. they talk about lunch. Do you know what your son did today or whatever? <laughs> yeah, totally. But um, And like when I was in fourth grade, my mom was actually my teacher for half of the day. There were two women that shared the job. Wow. I think she was in the afternoon. But How was it that was, for you? It was weird. It was really weird. Like yeah. if, if she disciplined one of the kids, I got beat up at recess or something oh. because of it. They're like, you're a mom. And I'm like, dude... <laughs> right, right. And if she was handing out worksheets and she was short of one, I didn't get to do it in class with everyone because she's like, I'll just bring one home later. I'll make one after school. Oh, for and sure. You can, and you can do it at home. So it, it was interesting. But, you know, I really got to see both sides of education because I they talked when they got home and I, I knew what I was yeah. getting into. Right. But, yeah, I, my, I actually got my first teaching job up in Door County at Sevastopol School oh. um, because my grandfather, who lived in Algoma, saw the ad in the paper. Oh. And he cut it out and mailed it to my college dorm room in Milwaukee at UW Milwaukee. Oh, and you know, he's and you were like, going to school for education. Yeah, yeah. And I was about to, you know, graduate in a couple of months. And he said, "I really think you should apply for this job. I think you'd like to live up in Door County." I was like, "Duh." Oh my god. <laughs> Who wouldn't? So you know, I went up there. I, I, I was able to get an interview, and I went up there, and um, I actually knew the music teacher that was there. Because she had gone to Silver Lake College in Manitowoc with my older sister that was, you know, that I mentioned went, was a music major. So she opened the door and we just like screamed and hugged each other. And she's like, oh, my gosh, are you here to apply for the job? And I said, yeah. And she had <laughs> built up such a huge program that they were adding another teacher. Wow. It wasn't like someone was leaving and they were replacing someone. Yeah. You know, they it was actually a new, new position. So, yeah, it 
it ended up being a great, great gig. So, That's super. Yeah, I was there for four years, and then I moved to Colorado for a year, and I just didn't like it. I thought I would love it. Why did you just, why? Um, the traffic was, the, was just so bad and all the What was your impetus and, to move to Colorado? Um, well, I had a fiancé, and my parents didn't like her, and it was just yeah, kind of a weird you know, I never thought that would happen in my yeah. life, that my parents wouldn't like somebody that I loved. But right. yeah, so I broke it off with her, and then I just needed to move away. So <sighs> gotcha. kind of start over. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I just, I pause there because I think it's super interesting how how and when we choose to shift yeah. gears or like, and to shake it up. And I think that's such a, that's a, something that I, I think, and many other people tend to do is like, if something isn't going right, how do we change everything to renew and in, instill and right. imbue and all of those things to like pick us back up? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, and I, I had traveled through Colorado before and I knew yeah. that it was, you know, such a magical place. So sure. And it was bizarre because school had already started when I moved to Colorado and I didn't have a Colorado teaching license. And there were only four schools in the state that I could have taught at because they were private and one of them needed a music teacher. Wow. They had started the school year without a teacher. So I saw an ad in the paper, you know, times are different. Now you find everything on your phone, but yeah, they needed a music teacher. So I applied and I got the job and it was a wonderful gig. Wow. Yeah, it was, it, they actually, it was at St. Mary's Academy in Englewood, Colorado, and they actually gave out the first high school diploma in Colorado. Oh. It was like the old school in wow. Colorado, and it was just, it was a magical place. Yeah, you, th you could see the mountains from the playground, and oh I loved Recess Duty because I could just go out and look at all the beauty. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, and but it then was, Wisconsin was like the drawback. Yeah, I really miss Lake Michigan, and I, I yeah. miss my family and yep. my friends and stuff, so I moved back, and I interviewed for a high school job, a middle school job, and an elementary job at three different cities. And I ended up getting the elementary job in Colby, Wisconsin, which is where the cheese was made. It's in the middle of the state. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I taught Colby. there for a year, and I um, wasn't planning on leaving. I had already signed my contract to go back there the next year, and then I ended up getting a call from Michigan High School, which is my alma mater. My oh. mom still lives in the house that I was born in. So, yeah, I I interviewed on the phone. Um, I was on a beach in Nebraska at, um, <laughs> when I got what? the call. And they wouldn't That's take the, no for an answer. I don't think I've ever heard that phrase before. I was yeah. on a beach in Nebraska. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Lake McConaughey. It's a man-made uh, water reservoir. It's that's it's awesome. that's a cool place too. But yeah, and so I they said, well, we're going to do a phone interview with you next week. Let's set something up. And I said, I have a job. I don't want this job. And they said, well, just let us interview you, and you know, we'll we'll see what happens. So um, I was in my sister and brother-in-law's kitchen doing a phone interview with my old band director that I went to high school oh through. Gosh. And then at the end of the call, he's like, yeah, we're going to offer you the job. I was like, I've told you like five times I don't want this job. Right. But I ended up taking it and it was, it was good. My mom ended up having breast cancer during that time. So I was there, you know, that wouldn't wow. have happened otherwise. Yep. Yeah, and then from there, I it's really wanted... beautiful serendipitous thing yeah. to have happen. Yeah, and yeah, that's really. And she survived. She's still alive. She's eighty three. She'll be eighty four next month. So oh. yeah, she's great. Um, but then I taught in Man uh, Mishka for three years, and then I was at the high school and junior high, and I never had time to do the things I liked because I was busy every night with track cross country and coaching volleyball and oh. stuff. So I really wanted an elementary job. And the elementary teacher in Mishicot wasn't retiring anytime soon. Yeah. Um, I was actually doing a musical theater show out at the Forced Inn with a principal from Manitowoc. Huh. <clears throat> and um, he said, well, we have an opening in Manitowoc for an elementary music teacher. So I, or I applied for it. And um, it, that made me feel really good because the day of my interview, I walked in and I knew all the other applicants that were there. Oh, yeah. And they just looked up and they were like, oh, are you applying for this job? And I said, yeah. And, and they just like 
they literally threw down their paperwork like work like oh i'm never gonna get this job if you're here <laughs> and it made me feel really good but really bad because i knew them all <laughs> right right yeah right, it was yeah. just so awkward but i was like well that's a confidence booster <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah right i did right. end up getting the job and yeah I, yeah finished out my last 23 years in manitowoc i actually got a call this morning from them because their middle school choir director quit Wow. And they want me to come back. I'm like, oh my gosh, gosh, gosh. I've been three years out of teaching. I don't know if I can. Yeah, right. Yeah. I don't know, but I'll maybe stop, walk through there tomorrow and see. It's just so weird. Yeah. What was one of your favorite things about teaching middle or uh, elementary school students? Um, Or what rises to the top for you? So in Manitowoc, they have six elementary schools. Oh. And they bust all of their kindergartners to one building us it was a seventh different building oh and um they didn't have music down there but i knew how important it was to have kindergarten music yeah. so every year at the end of the year at my k through or, or first through sixth grade job i would always apply to transfer to the kindergarten center to oh. be the music teacher so i had the paperwork in progress for years i mean it was just it was ridiculous because they they were never going to do that yeah but when they went from half day kindergarten to full day kindergarten, they needed to mirror the services that the students got in first grade, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which was music, art, and FIED. So, because I had already applied for the job like for three or four years, yeah. they knew I was interested. So, they approached me and said, Would you be willing to be a kindergarten music teacher? Yeah. So, that's all I did all day. I literally just taught kind of groups of kindergarten kids wow. all day all week <clears throat> and it was one of my favorite gigs ever i think i did it for 11 years oh my gosh i yeah. love kindergartners oh my gosh i do too well the great thing about it was um i think there were 18 or 20 classrooms of kindergarten wow and the classroom teachers used to try to do some musical experiences sure with them so they had they each had their own music kit. They had triangles, they had wood blocks, you know, they had little glockenspiels and things. And nice. when I moved in, they all brought their boxes of musical <laughs> instruments up to my room. So I probably had like, I mean, I had hundreds of instruments to choose from, yeah. which is great. Cause you know, when you're a kindergartner, if you ask them who's good at singing, they all raise their hand. Well, sure, they who's all Who's good are. at dancing, they all raise their hand. Absolutely. Who's good at playing the trumpet, they all raise their hand because they right. don't know. Right. And that's what I loved about being there. Yeah. And then having all of those instruments, we could all play the triangle at the same time. Yeah. We could all play the glockenspiel and the drums. And I, I got really, really good at teaching kindergarten music. Wow. I think I had 385 kids average generally every year that I saw twice a week. Wow, what an experience. It it was really cool. And the art teacher and the gym teacher that I worked with, they volunteered to go down there as well. And we would do collaborative things all the time. Like what? How Um, would you collaborate? So I would play music in the gym and they would draw to the music that I did. Or I'd play music and we would dance. Um, We had this- I love it. Oh, it was just magical. It, it was really, we, and we used to do these celebrations, we called them every couple of months. Like we would celebrate fall and cool. we would have all, all the kids would come to the gym and we would just, we'd, we'd do music. We'd kind of prep everything so the kids knew what was going to happen. So sure. they really could actively take part in it and feel confident in yeah. what they were doing. Um, we always told them a story during that. And the, I remember one particular activity we each gave, we had each class get into like a circle on the gym floor with a ball of yarn yeah and the kids would roll it across the circle and we ended up making a big spider web it was it was in fall yeah because each kid that the yarn came to they held on to their end of the yarn and then rolled it away from them to someone else yeah, and then we'd have them all stand up holding their spider web. And, oh my gosh, yeah, I love that. That was just that. one of the things we did. And then the book that we wrote was Anansi the Spider. Oh, sure. I loved yeah, a great book. Great yeah, book. about the kente cloth. And right. Then I, I had my African drum that had a kente cloth pattern on it, and we Beautiful. played the drum. And Yeah, but we used to do collaborative stuff like that all the time. That's so exciting. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I really liked it. And the high school band director would come to my kindergarten concerts because I would have my kids play xylophones. I would have the edge of the stage just lined with xylophones. Excellent. And each class, as they came in, would sit down and play a song and then go up onto the risers. And the next class would come in and play a different song and come up onto the risers. But all the kids knew how to play every song. Wow. And I'm a percussionist, too. I, 
I went to school. Um, my brother was a drummer when he was in f- uh, fifth grade, and he was six years older than I was. So oh. by the time Sweet I got time. to fifth grade, he was on the drum set in the basement, and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. So you play the drums. I do. Uh, mostly mallets. Um, I, I never, what does that mean, mostly mallets? Uh, xylophone, marimba. Oh. Uh, Glockenspiel. Cool. Um, okay. Chimes, the... Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tubular chimes, they call them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can do uh, two or three mallets in each hand. Wow. Yeah, besides singing. So um, I'll backtrack a little bit. Sorry, when yeah. I No, no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much to talk about. When I, I was um, <laughs> When I was in high school, I could sing. And I was the first freshman at Michigan High School. They had, they had a beginning choir and they had top choir. They had a beginning band and they had a top band. I was the first freshman ever in the history of the school that made the top choir and the top band my freshman year. Wow. Uh, I, just, I know music's just always been easy for me. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, when I was a sophomore and junior in high school, I was winning scholarships through the Music Association to go to summer music camp. And it just blows my mind now that... At that time, you went to summer music camp in Madison for two weeks. Oh. Two full weeks. That's uh, great. Yeah. You stayed in the dorms down there, and yeah. you had the weekend free. Like, me and the other music camp kids would just get on a city bus in Madison and go to the mall. And cool. we had so much freedom. I, You know, after 9-11 and all, all the other things that have gone on in this world, it's crazy to me that I was... 16 yeah. years old, just wandering around Madison with a bunch of other music students that I had just met. But yeah, the yeah, freedom great. seems to have um, shifted for sure. Yeah, but they used to, at the end of music camp, give away 10 full scholarships for tuition wow. to either UW-Madison or UW-Milwaukee. And they usually gave nine instrumental and one vocal. So I convinced my parents that if they would send me back to summer music camp because I had such a good time um, my, my junior year that I would win one of those scholarships and pay for college wow. and my parents were like okay yeah right you know whatever we just know you like the experience and it's it was a really quality experience for me so I did I went back my junior year and auditioned for one of those 10 scholarships I think there were 2,000 stu- vocal students that applied for one scholarship and I ended up winning it. Hey. Yeah, so I That's I got so a free great. ride to free ride to UW Milwaukee with all the tuition, but yeah. And so so like percussion and vocals were your thing. And yeah. 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 Um do you re- like what kind of like what kind of singing do you like to do? Um, like what genre or? So I, when I taught in Manitowoc, I was with the Lakeshore Wind Ensemble for 21 years. I was their uh, voc- male vocal performer. I would sing any any of the male, male vocal solos that they needed to be sung with the band. And they were like usually, as a tenor. Uh, I'm more baritone bass. Baritone bass. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually a low bass. I I tend to speak higher than than I sing. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. People so ask me all the time, so you're a tenor. I'm like, no, I've never been a tenor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I sang with them for 21 years. I was also the assistant conductor, and I t- um, conducted the children's choir for them at Christmas, percussion section leader. I was the vocal coach for any of the other th- singers that would come in. Oh, and man. I, I was also, they had a, the, they met on Tuesday nights, and then I also sang with the big band for 19 years. No way. That was fun. Oh, yeah, my gosh. Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. stuff. And yeah. Um, Michael Buble songs at the end. Cool. Yeah. And there were about 30 to 40 people in the big band. Wow. Yeah, so it was fun. You know, they would announce me, and I'd walk out in my tuxedo with my microphone and stand in front of that band and sing. Actually, the first time I ever <laughs> sang, the wind ensemble had 90 players. Oh, my God. The first time I actually walked out and sang with them, I was at rehearsal and they started the introduction and I didn't come in because I was so blown away by the sound. And the conductor cut the band off and he's like, that was you. And I said, I know, I missed it. (laughs) Because I was just so blown away by the sound. Yeah. (laughs) That's perfect. Welcome back to In the Act. I'm Erica Hunsinger. We are here with David Bourgeois. Um, I loved the the tail end of where we're at um, of you 
like coming on stage and like missing your cue, <laughs> like coming on stage. And mm-hmm. um, the idea of you performing all these like um, tunes and stuff is just is really exciting to me. So yeah, it was um, a great time. And most of it. Well, I think within the last 10 years, most of it is on YouTube. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, great. How would they find it? <clears throat> um, if you look under, now it's UWGB. Okay. Um, uh, Manitowoc Campus, Lakeshore Big Band or Lakeshore Wind Ensemble. And then if you just Google my name as well, David Bourgeois. B-O-U-R-G-E-I-O. O-I-S. Oh, I asked. Yes. Got it. Okay. It's in the dictionary. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's great. Yeah. that I loved performing with them. And now I sing with the Lakeshore Chorale out of Sheboygan. Oh, really? Okay. That's yeah, my second year. It's so exciting. I've always wanted to sing with them. And um, why? Uh, because I knew some of some of my singer and actor friends were in it, and they were like, "You should join our chorale." And I was like, "I can't because it's the same night that the Lakeshore Wind Ensemble rehearsed in Manitowoc." Okay. Same, pretty much same hours. So now that I'm not with that group, when I retired from teaching in Manitowoc, and when COVID hit, they kind of took a hiatus, and I thought, 21 years is enough to be with that organization, and 19 gotcha. with the big band." So. Right. And now I don't have to drive to Manitowoc. I can just walk to rehearsal for the Lakeshore Chorale. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah I really like that organization, too. And it's what kind of things? 41st season. 41st season? <clears throat> yeah. Wow. And what, what kind of music do they sing? Like all um, sorts? We or? just uh, finished Carmina Barana last month. What's that? Um, it's big, Carl Orff's big master work. Oh, I'm um, not familiar. If you heard it, you would know. You'd be like, oh, that. Okay, yeah. 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 You would know. Um but it, it's so there's such a professional choir, and our director comes up from Milwaukee, and our accompanist comes from Milwaukee every Tuesday wow. to work with us. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, if you're a singer and you want to join a choir, the Lakeshore Chorale is the way to go. Really? Yes. Interesting. Yes. So professional. I think we have um, 18 basses, nine tenors, 18 altos, and about 12 sopranos currently. Wow. Yeah. And I just became the vice president of the organization. So I'm glad to, you know, be able to get in on meetings and kind of help brainstorm ideas because I'm always thinking about how we can make more money and get more people in the seats and stuff. Totally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Of course you are. I mean, you're mm-hmm. just like, how can we do this? I'm going to go over right. here. All right. this, like, all this. Im- yeah. Um, yeah. So cool. <laughs> um, meanwhile, like, you're gardening and, like, doing all these Im- – amazing things and yeah, I love plants running and walking and yeah yeah, yeah. I think I've Super I've done active. 68 or 69 half marathons really in my life and oh my gosh four full marathons <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I had a friend one time that was training to do a marathon I'm like why are you doing all this running well can't you just show up on the day and run and he's like no you can't and I'm like I actually think I could I think I could actually just show up and do a full marathon. And he's like, I don't think you could. Well, I didn't do that. I trained. But I found the program with the least amount of running. Yeah. Because I hate running. But I love racing. Like, I love the atmosphere of being at the starting line with all those people. Oh. And everyone's, you know, nervous. And you're just excited. And the gun goes off. And everyone. I love that. Sure. Oh, but I totally I hate see running, that. running, just slodging around the neighborhood and, you know, putting yeah. in nine or ten miles every day to try to. <laughs> yeah. I hate it. Oh, my gosh. That's so, so funny. Yeah. But, like, that energy, it's such an, it's so interesting that you identified that that's, like, the energy that you like. Because I, right. I have only been in a couple of plays in like theater, um, like in high school and stuff. Mm-hmm. But my father was always in, you know, being minister and stuff. There was like yeah. this on stage bit to it, and that like um, welling up of um, anticipatory excitement and anxious and scared and right. like um, yeah. feels very much like starting a race. Oh, is that sure. like how you yeah. felt? Like, is that how you feel when you're going on stage? Or um, you know, I perform so much, I don't get nervous anymore. I, yeah, I really don't. If I'm nervous, then I really question why. Um, I, the last time I was really nervous, I was with a cast of people that no one knew their lines. Oh, and that made me nervous because I couldn't control what was about to happen on stage. Totally, and it was like a murder mystery type deal in yeah. Green, Green Bay, and people had paid a lot of money to be there. 
a yeah. lot of money to be there. And I just could see it was going to be a total train wreck. So I was nervous about that. For sure. But I was prepared to just like take over the stage if I had to and keep the play going. Because oh my gosh. I had really worked on my lines and to be prepared. And I kind of knew what, who was supposed to say what, when. And if yeah. they didn't, I kind of made my way Prompt over to them. them. and Yeah, prompted them. And yeah, it, it, I was a... It was just a train wreck that night. I was so nervous. I bet. Because yeah. it didn't go well. Right. And people pe people in the cast ended up having their scripts on stage and still didn't know what was going on because they didn't have them open. I'm wow. like, dude, no one's going to care right. if you have your book open at this point because, right. I mean, we just, just need to get through this so these people can eat and go home. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. But um, I really do enjoy performing and that's one thing that because I perform so much when I taught elementary yeah and and kindergarten is my students know that I performed because I did it almost every weekend so I would I, I would say you know I'm not lying to you it, this, you're gonna get on stage and your parents are gonna be out there and it's gonna be okay you're gonna enjoy doing this in front of them and um, my wow. music room. At that's the a really big thing, oh. though. I mean, because that's like it's, yeah. it's like one of the top stressors of like any adult, uh, you know, yeah. is like speaking or being in front of people. And right. so for you to in, like to say that um, to these, you know, and yeah. is really meaningful. Yeah. yeah. Well, and um, my classroom was actually the stage. So there oh. was a portable wall that opened. Oh, nice. And um I would just tell them, we're just going to have music class, but it's going to be with this wall open and, you know, people that love you are going to be sitting out there and they're going to be clapping for you. So you can decide what kind of applause you want. Do you want them to be like, oh, yeah, that was good, you know, you <laughs> or do you want them to be really excited and like cheering? And yeah. of course, they would always say, we want them to cheer. I said, well, then you need to sing the song like this. You yeah. need to perform like this. Yeah. And, and I would always do something every concert that would make the audience cry every time. And and I um, I got really good at it because <laughs> I would tell even the tough boys, you know, I was like, your parents would never expect to see you standing up here singing this song, and it's going to make your mom and dad cry. And they they they, you know, they um, took that hook, line, and sinker because they wanted to see their parents cry. Oh, <laughs> and so they would, yeah. you know, like um, we would sing "Love Me Tender." Wow. Uh, with my kindergartners. And oh they, I mean, they'd just be sobbing, you know, because they never saw it coming. Right. They didn't know what we did in class. And, what, you know, you hear, and I would have 100 kindergartners at every concert singing. So oh you have 100 gosh. kindergartners up there singing Love Me Tender. And, yeah, or, you know, some, other, some other songs like that. But I want to tell you how I use creativity creativity in my classroom so great yeah um in order to get my kindergartners to play the xylophones um i wouldn't start with the xylophones i would start with paper so they would have a construction paper that looked like a xylophone that had the alphabet letters on yeah and i would give them a drinking straw not a mallet so that they could just point with me and i would have a big chart on the wall um and one of the songs i started with was miss mary mack Sure. Miss Mary Mac Mac Mac, Mac, Mac all dressed, all dressed in, in black, 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 black. Right. It just keeps button, those fun, fun. four notes just keep repeating. Yeah. So um, we do C D E F F F C D E F F F. So they would, you know, they're learning to read. They're learning their alphabet. So they would take their straw and point to the C and the D and the E and the F three times, and then they'd go back and do it again. And eventually, uh, they'd come into my room, and I would give them a mallet instead of the straw, so they were actually tapping with the mallet. Yeah. And then. We'd get out the xylophones, and they already knew how to play it. So they would all sit down and do it on the xylophones. So yeah, we. So the success from rate then, oh, because you took small steps, right. and showed them the technique and the skills, right. and um, and they got comfortable with that and saw every. Then it was a pattern that they knew, yep. and then you br bred success right there. Then. Right, yeah. And the other one I would do is Old MacDonald had a farm, and they would at first do the E I E I O, yeah, which is the black keys. The you know on a piano the black keys are two groups of two groups of three groups of two groups of three. Yes. Well, the group of three, it's the black keys. Oh, I didn't e -I -E -I -O. know that. E I E I O, yeah. Oh. So then 
Nice. Um, yeah. I'm gonna, like go home and try that. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> then, oh, snort. Darn. Then I would jump them down to the two pattern because old McDonald is jumping down to one of the two black keys. Oh yeah. At a farm is the second black key, and then they would jump up to the three keys. E I E I O. Yeah. So oh, I they, love it. Yeah. So all my kindergartners, Manitowoc's probably. <laughs> crawling with EIEIO people. Oh my gosh. Um, and Miss Mary Max. <laughs> right? Yeah. But I taught them all how to do that. And they would do it at the concerts. And oh. another thing I did um, is uh, kids don't use books anymore, especially textbooks. Everything's online or on the computers. So yeah. um, because of budget cuts, I had to use textbooks for first through fifth grade with my music students. Okay. But I would try to have them open up to page 52, and they would have no idea how to do that. Interesting. They, they literally couldn't turn to pages. So I thought, well, if I can teach them in kindergarten, to that would benefit me for the rest of my elementary classes. Because I could say, open up to page 103, and they would know how to do it. Right. So I took construction paper, and I bound my own little book. And on the cover, I wrote zero. And if you turn the page, one would be on you know, the left side and two would be on the right side. So I would actually have them count to 100 with me. Great. I would make these books, yeah. And, um, but I didn't just do it dry. I, I listened to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, songs, orchestral songs, nothing with words, so that we could count to music. Oh. And at first I was using the tune Green Sleeves because I love it, but... Can you... Mm, Da, 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 it's also okay. what child is this? Oh, it is yeah. right, right. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, but that, like most songs, is an eight beat or eight measure phrases. Okay. Well, eight doesn't equal a hundred very well, so oh, I would right. always have to like quick get up and shut the music off, even though we would count to a hundred. Right. But one day I would put music on like during my prep time or while I was getting ready in the morning or driving sure. home at, to work and back. I would put on classical music CDs trying to find the perfect 100 beat song. Oh my and gosh, I, I love it. I finally did. No way. Yes, Shenandoah. Shenandoah like from the musical? Um, from No, the the Oh Shenandoah, I long to see you. Da da da. That melody? No, okay, is I don't know it. 20 beat it's got 20 beats to it. So all I had to do is record and I have a recording studio at my home. So oh. I made a recording that started out kind of quietly, <clears throat> but then I added more instruments. And by the end, with the key changes and everything, we ended it really splendidly at 100 wow. beats. <clears throat> That's so, so fun. Yeah, so I would sit in front of the kindergartners and turn the page. But a byproduct of this is they all learned how to count on the beat or clap with the beat. That's huge. Because yeah. we were counting one, two, three. three. Four. We were counting right. on the beat. So by them verbally counting on the beat, they were able to keep a beat with their bodies. Absolutely. As a byproduct of that. Yeah, Absolutely. It was crazy. Yeah. And it like filters in to, to oh, everything yeah. and yeah. it affects everything that it affects like how you're moving, like with dance and stuff. It affects like how right. you understand numbers and it like influences like your ability to right. um, perform yep. mathematical things. Like it's yeah. so integral to. And the classroom teachers were like, <clears throat> So cool. glad that I was teaching them how to count in music as well. Sure. Because then, you know, they could literally count to 100. And we would do it at the concert. I would schedule it with the kindergartners. Probably, like, I think I did 20 or 22 songs with them at their concert, which is unheard of as well. What? Yeah. <clears throat> but I would put how it. How did you do <laughs> How did you do 22 at the I would, concerts? Um, I would put it. Uh, about halfway through so they would all sit down on the risers and we would just count so the audience could hear us counting but that always got big applause as well of course yeah, yeah because they're all learning how to do it and I had so many bilingual students yeah so many that uh, you know English was their second language but they learned how to count to 100 and sing yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I mean art is the um, the vehicle to process so much yep and to um, integrate so much yeah. and to express so much. Yeah. And um, it's just so important in in like our early lives to instill that mm -hmm. um, because it affects everything. Mm -hmm. I just like, it's just so important. And, yeah. you know, for like, yeah, for um, kids who their first language is in English and it's required um, right. to, to learn, um, um, 
you know, it, that's such a valuable experience then to um, teach through play right. and to teach through self-expression yeah. and to teach through um, something that feels enjoyable, yes. um, that that doesn't feel as hard in, in some ways, that you have like partnerships in learning mm-hmm. and um, enjoy. Right. And that's, you know, part of what I'm hearing from you is this like passion that you're instilling and also this joy of this collective. Right. Yeah. I, I when I started in Manitowoc, the so class, cool. t- the time that the classes were were 35 minutes, which is a long time for kindergarten. Then they increased yeah. it to 45. Yeah. <clears throat> so I used to read to the kids every day. Sometimes I'd read several books. We would dance every day. How would you choose your books? Um, usually on a subject of what I was teaching that month. Okay. Um, and just because I was using my voice so much all day, I mean, with kindergarten, you're always giving directions. Yep. I would um, try to find books that had CDs. Yep. So when I taught them Love Me Tender, they actually listened to Elvis singing it. And then nice. there was a picture book that went with it. It was a way for them to hear, you know, um, good singers. I used Diana Ross. I used um, Billy Joel, um, Carly Simon. Cool. Yeah, you know, just uh, Louis Armstrong. What a wonderful world. But it gave my voice a break. But then they were uh, hearing famous people like Barbara Streisand. It's like seasoning. I mean, it's like cooking. Like how how can you incorporate different pieces to um, enliven what you're doing, like enrich and what Mm -hmm. sits with one person might not sit with the other, you know, like yeah. what, what What do you like? What are you drawn to? I used to do a bunch of classical listening music with them too. We listened awesome. to opera all the time. Ah, um, yeah. I was just listening to Pagliacci this morning. Oh, I was just listening nice. to um, Pavarotti singing. <laughs> yeah. It was so beautiful. I was like crying in the bathroom. Like I got to talk to David about this. <laughs> the feeling behind it. Yeah. But I, I, used, oh, I used, I would call it active music listening. So we would always be doing something while we were listening because a lot of times they couldn't sit still, especially at the first hearing. So sometimes I would just like do hand movements with my hands while we were listening and they would mirror me. Like I would tell them to look at their hand like they've never looked at it before and try to notice different lines or different wrinkles in their skin. And I would really stress that while we're listening to this song that I'm gonna play, I really don't want you to talk. And I'm not gonna talk either because we're really going to listen to the singer sing the song. But we would be moving while we did it. So sometimes we'd use scarves. Sometimes we'd be in a circle holding hands or, you know, walking forward or backward in a circle or just, you know, any, anything to keep them actively listening but engaged. Yeah. So, And then I would often do those um, – songs at the concerts as well that was another reason that i could get their parents to cry because there'd be this opera singer just singing this glorious aria and all these kids would just be moving their hands and yeah yeah Welcome back to In the Act. I am Erica Hunsinger, and this is In the Act. I already said that. Um, we're here with David Bourgeois. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for asking me. That's Man, I just love hearing about um, your experiences with young children. It's just really exciting to me. And um, yeah, I am, you know, every child you you were in contact with and shared your creativity and your vision and is just the better for it, like, Making oh, better humans out there, David. Yes. It was <laughs> I a really love it. magical part of my life. I, I love it. You yeah. know, I, I told you I had them play instruments all the time, but one thing I want to mention was I had these little children's accordions that just played like an octave. <laughs> yeah. And I bought them because I thought they would be fun. And um, I didn't have enough for everyone. So I, I set out hula hoops around my room in spring and I would put all the odd instruments that I only had a couple of and the kids would wander around. I'd, I'd 
flick the lights on and off when it was time for them to move to the next circle. Great and they directive. Got, yeah, and they got to play those accordions. But I told them to stay by their hula hoop when they were playing them. Yeah. But with the accordions, they couldn't. Right. They would end up walking around the entire room. Oh, And I was like, okay, guys, I told you, you know, you need to stay here. And I went up to the, to the physical therapist because even the best kids that always followed every direction and never were a problem, they were wandering all over my room. And I was like, you need to sit down over here and play this. They that couldn't. so fascinating. They had to walk while their arms were making that accordion right. motion. <laughs> So I, I went to my principal and I said, I want to start a marching band. And she was like, what? I said, what? I want to buy 45 of these accordions and I want them to march in the Labor Day parade. And we did. We did for years. Come so we'd have on. two, we'd, we'd have about half of the school would show up. We'd have about 200 kindergartners and 45 of them would have these accordions. And then there'd be kids with tambourines and drums behind them. And we would always go down the street in front of the high school band. Oh, yeah, That's so it was just fantastic. a sight to see. Uh, it was it was wonderful, but to this day, I don't know why m- moving that accordion made their feet walk. Interesting. That's and, so interesting. Yeah. However, the important part of that is a creative decision making part on your part, being the teacher. Yeah. Instead of you think... could have said, "Hey, stay <laughs> in that like and get that real firm tone," You're and right. like no. you have to do this right. But that's like what <laughs> it was like. We was make in... those decisions every day, right? Yeah. Like, how do we respond to these things? But yours was okay. I noticed this We're is a pattern. Like yeah. We're gonna go with it, and that's mm-hmm. like such a like Tai Chi like yeah. moving with moving through. So good, man. Right. Following that, I love it. And. Before the parade, I would take every classroom outside in spring, and we'd wander around the entire building. So just me and a bunch of kids behind me playing accordions to, to practice for the parade. And it was a two-mile parade. Oh and the God. first, I know it's crazy. I can't believe we did this. The first mile was literally uphill. Because where, where the parade started in Manitowoc, you actually walk oh, uphill. Yeah. And then you turn, and then you have the second mile which is relatively flat and a little more shady. Oh my god. But yeah, goodness, it was it was just, oh, it was magical. So great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So I'm going to like uh, switch switch gears because I want to hear about. Um, I don't know how many productions you said that you were in, like how many musical theaters and how many acting experiences and movies and commercials. Like, mm-hmm. want you to get into that too and like okay. talk about like yeah. maybe some of your favorites or so when i was in high school i you know could sing yeah. i just had this i would open my mouth and i was such a skinny little person <laughs> and this voice would come out of me and people would just they laugh you They'd might actually like, have to like yeah you know sing something no oh. <laughs> they're like i can't believe that voice is coming out of you but <laughs> a, a byproduct of that was i got parts in the plays and the musicals and i had to yeah. act and i was so painfully shy as a child like if my parents knew someone in a store i would hide behind them interesting and okay. so it was that was a lot of work for me to be able to get out on stage and to um transformative man yeah yeah so because my musical talent uh, was giving me all of these opportunities to be on stage. I had to learn how to do it. Wow. Um, so I, had, I just had really great teachers with, um, you know, practicing every day with them. And like, you're, you've got this. You can go out and do this in mm-hmm. front of people. And mm-hmm. they only want you to do good. They don't want you to fail. No. They, they want to hear your best performance. Absolutely. And they want to see you enjoying yourself. So, yeah, yeah that, that was great. So I've had leading roles in over 190 different operas and plays and musicals throughout my life. And then when I retired from teaching three years ago, it was always a bucket list of mine to be in a movie. So I started auditioning and sending in my resume, which is, you know, from here to Jesus. <laughs> and um, uh, I ended up getting part. So in three years, I've been cast in 12 movies. Whoa. Yeah. And it's been so much fun. I can't believe I waited this long to do it. So I really enjoy it. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Um, can you talk about a role that you really liked doing? Like, I don't know. Um, so one of the first something. ones I did yeah. was a, it was a music video for a punk rock band in Milwaukee. Oh, fun. They were looking for an old man who was grumpy and hated punk rock music. And <laughs> um, they they ended up like, um, in, in the video, you see me complaining because I buy a TV, brand new television that only plays punk rock music. So I'm com- calling up and complaining. I saved my receipt. You know, this... 
television is junk. And then I go on the computer and I'm on Craigslist looking for a new TV and it's the band. They're, they're like trying to get me to go to their house. So I show up at this house to get this free TV and they bring me down in the basement and they tie me to a gurney and they actually <laughs> plug their electric guitars into my body. Like they, there's a, <laughs> so a little shot of them putting the cord, you know, that you'd put in the amp into my skin. And then I'm like convulsing on this gurney because they're playing, their, they're piping their music directly into me. Yeah, it was such a great experience. Oh, that's so fun. I'm still fun. friends with the band. I, I, every once in a while, I drag Lucas out to, down to Milwaukee to go see one of their shows. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, and they've come to who see are, me perform who are they? too. Uh, they're called the Nile Club. Okay, N I L E, yeah. and the music video is called The Black Knight. Awesome. K N I G T. Of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's it's cool. A great song. Yeah, and the videographer, he was like, wow. The first time we ran through what he needed me to do, he's like, wow, you're a really good actor. I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> so we did it again and again, and then after we got done doing the footage that he needed he said i want to do like an after interview with you so he he had all this additional footage of me yeah. that i don't know what he's gonna do with but it was just a blast yeah yeah so fun that's great mm-hmm. and um, i've been a um yeah i've been a um sex offender based on a true story wow um, that's still in post-production uh, a movie called the astronaut that's a fantastic fantastic script that's still in post-production i can't Excellent. wait for that one to come up. oh how exciting yeah and i was actually doing those at the same time so i was the, you know in the astronaut movie <laughs> being the sex offender and i was driving down to milwaukee on different days and i had to remember how to do my hair and because at that time i had that big long mustache that i would curl up oh right well, yeah for the astronaut i would curl it up but for the sex offender movie they didn't want me in a curly mustache right so i was like driving to walkie like i'm what am i Who doing am today I? Yeah. yeah do i have the right look and everything but yeah and centering like how do you yeah yeah, yeah all of that script. like yeah um preparation for like sitting down into a role mm-hmm. and like becoming that yeah. is a uh, is an art yeah. yeah my dad would always say how do you memorize all those lines when he would come to see a show and i i finally got to the point where i said to him dad could you tell me the story of goldilocks and the three bears right now and he would say eh, i think i can so i said well do it tell me about it and so he would go into it and i said that's how i do this Wow. It's a story. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. And you just need to know where you are throughout this two-hour show or whatever it is, you know, if we're doing The Sound of Music or whatever. Right. Um, straight plays are a little harder because there's just more dialogue. Music is so easy for me. I mean... Interesting. If, yeah. If it's a musical, the songs, I memorize those almost, you know, before... Oh, for sure. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Before yeah. the first week is over. Right. It's, it's the dialogue. But I've really gotten good at learning how to memorize the dialogue. Um, sometimes it's like if I'm sitting in the chair in this stage, I do this part of the speech. Or I, I literally look at the words, and this is the paragraph that has a lot of W words in, like when, where, why. Oh. So, you know, I, yeah. I really pick apart the script that way. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the insight into that. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. like the those are the fibrous, interesting things I think that are the underbelly of acting and and yeah. understanding how to prep for something. And, and one of my favorite roles was Tony and Tony and Tita's wedding. I did that at the Forest Inn up in Tish Mills at Little Dinner Theater. It's a four oh. hour play. Oh my gosh! And it's it's like you're actually going to a wedding. So there's the um, reception. And the, there's the actual bridal ceremony Wow! where the people are sitting in church and the groomsmen and the bridesmaids are coming down the aisle and then we say our vows. And then there's the party after and the dinner. Cool. So yeah, yeah. But that's, wow. you, and you had to be in character all the time. So if I went into the bathroom and there were gentlemen in the bathroom that were at the play, I was Tony, I was the groom getting married. So oh, you, you could awesome. never leave that script. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's really that fun. That really taught me how to improvise because none of that was in the script. That was just you being the groom in the moment. And, and making yeah. the decisions based yeah. on that character. Right. right. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Is, is that a, is that a, f- Yeah. There, aren't there like two different types of acting like as well? I don't remember what those are called. Like different actors do 
different things. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Whatever. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, do you have like, um, like, you know, in terms of your, you were saying like your bucket list too, like do you have some role or something that you really want to do still hmm. that like – I don't know. Kind I mean, of itching for. I've been in so many. Pl- I've I've been in um, chi- Chicago a couple of times. I've been in um, a chorus line three different times. Wow. Played three different characters and cool. Oklahoma a couple of times. You know some of some of the major musicals. I've been in La Boheme three different times. Wow. Yeah. At Milwaukee in Colorado, and um, in Green Bay. Yeah. Wow. Three completely different productions of it. But, you know, the music and the story is all the same. Right. So. But, yeah. Yeah, I don't so know. So just the like continuation of that mm-hmm. rich, like, continuing doing all. I love it. Yeah. yeah. And I got to be in Singing in the Rain doing the Gene Kelly part. That's probably one of my f- other favorite roles that oh, I enjoyed. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was just so wonderful With experience. dancing then, too? With and dancing and it rained on stage. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, that was so fun. Yeah, just the rain pouring down and me jumping around on stage in it. And that song actually comes right before intermission. And I had read that most of the men that had done that on Broadway got sick because of being wet on stage. So everyone knew that when that song was over and the curtain came down, I was going to be stripping my clothes off and running down the hall way to the dressing room in my underwear to try to dry off. Yeah. So, and I... I didn't get sick, I think, because of that. But we had a couple of hair dryers ready in the dressing room to try to get me warm. And Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really good experience. Wow, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. That's yeah. another thing about theater. <laughs> you get to see people in their underwear backstage all the time. Cause, totally. Yeah. Right. I mean, you the costume changes for that were ridiculous. I oh, mean, I bet. Uh, there were literally times I'd be off stage and there'd be two adults ripping. One adult would be taking my clothes off and someone else would be pulling my pants up and putting shirts on me and right because you know, I needed to get back out on stage. Amazing. Yeah. That that is a um everyone has to work together oh, in this yeah. like really tight um mm-hmm. and I knew when to pick my foot up cuz someone was going to be putting a shoe on me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's it was, so great. It, yeah. I mean, it was <laughs> it's crazy. I I often think that should be filmed. There should be a documentary series about what goes what goes on backstage. Absolutely, just at a community wants to theater. Know. I'm not yeah. even talking Broadway. No, I know. I'm just like yeah. Do you know that they you know they broadcast the Met um, yeah. operas oh, and they show during they intermissions do. I've seen they go backstage and interview the actors and yes. actresses um, and singers and how they're like moving around. Um, yeah. What you know, and Isn't so that that's fantastic? a really interesting insight into yeah. that part of it. And it's the Met; it's really right. amazing. But like every exactly like every right. like local theater, everybody has their own. Because um, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The, the show backstage is almost more interesting to me sometimes than what's going on oh on stage. Oh my gosh. And hysterical. Yeah. And like yeah. how you adapt because something broke or like mm-hmm. this doesn't work. And so, how do we, you know, re- do something else in terms of like thinking creatively on the spot right. and in a team environment yeah. is such a wonderful thing. And I think that team experience, uh, now that we're talking about it, is. Uh, provides the success, right? Like yes. you're reliant on other people right. for your singular success. Right. Yep. And it's, um, I feel like that's such a, you know, when you're talking about like making the spider web with the kids, right? Like it's so much about like, whose yarn ball are you rolling? Right. And where is it going? And are they catching it? And are you part of this web you're part of this web with everybody. Right. You know, yeah. we all have different yeah. experiences and different understandings and passions and stuff, but we're all connected. And and mm-hmm. our we have to help each other. We do. <laughs> like, we yeah. Do. That's so Pick important. up your foot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So important. Um sorry. Yeah. I I remember being in uh one particular production where everything was going wrong and it was here in Sheboygan at UW Sheboygan. Uh, we were doing Agatha Christie's Mouse Trap. Cool. And there's doors and entrances everywhere, but the doors weren't openings. For some reason, they were locked. And so 
we'd have to just change our blocking and go out a different door or go through the kitchen instead of going outside. And yeah. at one point, um, Mrs. Boyle slammed one of the doors at our exits and one of the pictures above the doorway fell off with a glass frame and smashed all over the stage. So, you know, we couldn't ignore it. We had to go pick it up. So, right. you know, there we are, me and my wife at our house. This was like our house. So we're over there cleaning up this broken thing while the rest of the scene is going on. And it just things were, things like the entire night were going like that. It was just crazy. Wow. So, you know, we went with it. We made it work. But that show in particular and it happened right after 9-11 it was we had a flag on the stage that was lit during the entire performance and i think that was our first night going back wow. after that and i mean just adding to the surrealness of 9-11 that was yeah. just so bizarre yeah for sure yeah but we made it through but like you said it was teamwork we just helped each other get through that absolutely <laughs> and you can't help but be affected by significant cultural events, significant events in the world yep. that impact your mood, um, how you, like, you know that we, like, uh, twist in our heads a little bit and, you know, might not have hung the picture frame above the door, mm -hmm. you know, maybe in um, a, a bit of a, a mind fog or right. something like that. And yeah. all of those different things, when, we, when we're all experiencing it collectively, really change how... Um, things are kind of put together. But mm -hmm. then, you know, it's such a great example then of, okay, all of these things have gone wrong, but we're in it together. How do we make it work and function and yeah. address the things that are falling on stage? Right, you right. know, like, how do we do this? It's so cool. The thing I remember, I didn't think I was going to be talking about 9-11 today, but the things that I remember most about it was after it happened, You'd be walking down the street and people were asking how everyone was doing. Like people were saying hello to each other. Yeah. And I'm a runner. I would, you know, be out on the sidewalk running and or biking and no one cared. But after 9-11, people were really concerned about each other. And we were saying hello to people and opening doors for people in grocery stores. Cause yeah. Yeah. We were and worried about each I th other. Yeah. We were worried about each other. Yeah. And I, I think that... Um, you know, just those simple acts of like opening the door for somebody and like those everyday, um, I see you, mm -hmm. I notice you, I'm acknowledging you, yeah. um, makes such an impact. Um, I mean, I have a lot of friends, and but it, it makes an impact on me for the person that's lonely or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, doesn't have much or, you know. Those tiny little instances make such a huge reverberation, I think, yeah. um, into into your daily life. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time. Oh, this so, has been so fun. Yeah, it's so yeah. great. I, yeah, I, you said at one point you felt like you could talk for three hours. I'm like, you, we can talk about this I have forever. so many stories. If yeah. um, somebody wanted to get a hold of you... Um, for any reason, um, like for your acting or anything, how would they do that? Um, you can find me on Facebook. It's David Bourgeois. Can you spell that? B-O-U-R-G-E-O-I-S. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. And my email is bourgeoisbase at gmail.com. Bass, B-A-S-S, -S, not the fish. It's not bass. It's because I sing bass. <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah, bourgeois bass. So. Can you take us out on a note? What would you like to hear? I don't know. <laughs> I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. She's crying. Sorry. <laughs> thanks, And I'm David. trying not to. You're welcome. This was really lovely. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Huge thanks to Mead Public Library, the fantastic Melissa Prentice, Josh Littner, Annalisa Finca, the Radio Committee, our amazing engineer, John Tully, and for the title, Photo and Fabulous, theme music composed and performed by Cooper Deers. 
In the Act is produced in the studios at Mead Public Library in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. More information on the web at meadpl.org.